Today is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Paul Rodriguez to the Making It Real podcast, the podcast for founders who take action. Paul, so great to have you on the show today. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Jan. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you, actually. Wonderful. Uh, Paul, uh, what was the background for you personally? What did you do and how did you decide to start a company? You're on a mission now where like, we have to talk about that, where you say every minute minute is brain. So it's all about saving brains and actually lives. I think you have a wonderful mission, but I wonder as well, how did you end up in the entrepreneurial space? What did you do before and how did you get started? Yeah, well, actually, I, I always say that my life has been a bit like the Truman Show, like the film, because I, well, I, I, I studied engineering, then I moved to consulting, I entered into corporate and, and to honestly, into banking, most of it. And I, I really enjoyed the, that process, but I always wanted to be entrepreneur at a certain point. So I, I did my MBA in Bocconi in Milan. And I thought that that was the right moment to, to try to become entrepreneur or join a startup and explore this space. So through an investor there in Italy, I, I had to the chance to join a, an early stage biotech startup in pediatric oncology. I spent there a couple of years and, and I fell in love with healthcare, right? So bringing technology uh, and, and molecules to, to save lives. And, and after spending a couple of years there, I realized I wanted to focus in, in deep tech and bringing a technology in, that could be AI or any other technology in healthcare. So I spoke with several investors here in Spain and, and I had the chance to meet Marta Gaia Zanki, who is the founder of Nina Capital. And she invited me to be entrepreneur in residence with her. So basically I would help her to analyze investments but also was a good opportunity for me to, to find a company that I could join with and, 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 and bring it to the market. So then I, I met Christian Marti, who is the founder actually of MeThings, the company I'm the CEO of. And he had this wonderful technology that is an AI software to try as a stroke, to make that every patient in the world to have the best diagnosis and try as tool and have the best treatment. So we, we got along very well and I joined the company a couple of years ago as CEO of the company. And he takes care of the technology and me of the, the business side of it. And together we're bringing this to the market. So mm -hmm. wonderful journey as well. I, I imagine if we take the early steps because many people are out there and they maybe work in business, they work in banking or so, they have a business background and now they think about maybe actually you know that mission about doing something in the healthcare space and uh, know something as important as savings life would really, really motivate them. But then they might feel like, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't have that medical knowledge. I have, don't have that deep domain knowledge in biology. And so what did you have that fear potentially too? And what was your background that you said, no, I can actually be a successful entrepreneur in that space? Well, I think that everybody has, brings different, different values to a team, right? And, and having a management consulting background allows you to, to have this holistic approach to management and particularly to communicate ideas, right? So you need to analyze which is the problem. And typically they say the slides, right? But, but thinking in a slide mode is also useful to explain investors and, and explain what is the roadmap you need to follow. So if you partner with somebody that you trust and knows the science and you can understand the vision and the business sense of it, you, you're able to bring these things forward. So, so I think that having this business background, if you combine it with the science, you can do great things. And it's something that is feasible. Wonderful, there's another element there. Uh, we, we talked before, you're a professional rugby player, then as such you played actually for the Spanish team rugby. So, and I find as well that many people out there, they have this uh, interest in sports, they are practicing sports, some of them do competitive sports as well. And I always wonder, does that help you in becoming an entrepreneur? How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I played rugby for many years. And for, mm, I think that the, the fact that, particularly in rugby, that is quite, um, quite I wouldn't say like a, a contact sport in which your team is kind of your family and you fight against 
or you these challenges and these games that you have is pretty much uh, is very useful with entrepreneurship because you have people from very different backgrounds in terms of sizes and skills you have a key goal and you really need to trust the work of the others it happens with many sports too uh, but but this is it happens a lot with entrepreneurship you need to have a vision of what do we want to do but then you need to rely on the work of the different people and leverage on their skills so uh, with the founder and the rest of the team we are committed to solve this this uh, problem in stroke stroke diagnosis and we've been able to bring together uh, talents from different backgrounds and work consistently uh, and in a perseverant way to to bring it to the market uh-huh that one as well i find super interesting because no actually my background there is in rowing and rowing is not a sport that you really enjoy while practicing it's actually very hard and you have but you have to have that determination that ultimate determination to always keep on going and so would you say as well in rugby and i guess not as in many other sports and maybe areas where people really strive that that mindset uh, set that is shaped by this practice really helps you in, get, uh, in getting going and as well in sustaining that energy level yeah in fact uh, because in every sport and you'll know very well too is a matter of of um, the process so i think that to be entrepreneur you must love the process it's not about making money it's not about uh, the being like a superstar is about loving the process and loving to train. I always say people, when you see the Olympic games, they all would like to be there. But the question is not if you'd like to be there, the question is if you'd like to spend all your life working for that. Exactly, <laughs> if your the answer journey, is no, yeah. if you, it, then don't do it because it's very tough. So, so that's the question. If you enjoy the process, whatever happens is valuable. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. If we then take that no determination, you went into the uh, biology space. Uh, coming back to that as well, did you have a background? How do you feel about? Because to me, it, look from the outside a bit, it always seems extremely uh, demanding. And so to get that knowledge, how it actually works, and so would you say is that for for people maybe that don't have that biology background, is there a spot? And what's the best way to prepare for that? To train for that? I think that the most important skill an entrepreneur must have is understanding the story and communicating very well. I think this is a very important skill, regardless of the technology you use that always changes and the industry you're at. It's about trying to think what makes sense and try to synthesize that, define some milestones and bring people together. So, um, in, in healthcare, I would say is uh, very, very challenged because you have uh, the clinical need that you need to understand. You need the technology that actually solving this problem. You have a very complicated regulatory process. And then the reimbursement strategy and the go to market is something that is, is very is changing and evolving a lot. And, and then you have a lot of partnerships and a lot of players that you need to engage with. So you need to navigate in all these aspects and, and you really need to see what makes sense and who's the people that can help you move through this, this, this industry, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so if we take the example you know, of meetings, the company that you uh, co-founded that you're building now, you met Christian, he had this technology, I think it's fascinating in the stroke area. Uh, correct me, I think strokes is the second biggest area that of, in terms of fatalities, actually, of people dying yeah. of, of strokes, uh, right? So tell me what was kind of like the trigger to, to say, okay, we're going to start something in that space because, you no, know, Pablo, I think you and as well, Christian, you are not technically from that medical space then. No, absolutely. So, so again, um, so Christian started uh, four years ago. Uh, he sold his first company to TomTom Tom Telematics, and, and he was the CEO of TomTom. Tom. And as a, as a good engineer, he wanted to, to use her, his capabilities together with, with Hospital Clinic, that is a major uh, hospital here in Spain, to assess uh, healthcare, right? So he looked at different diseases, could be Alzheimer, prostate, and he saw that uh, stroke uh, really required early diagnosis. So as you said earlier, in stroke, uh, time is brain. 
So have in mind that the 15 minute delay or 20 minute delay to a treatment. So a stroke is having, for example, one of the kind of strokes is having a clot in the brain. So you want to remove the clot and 20 minutes can make the difference. So the current protocol, how it works is patient has a stroke. They go to a hospital and they do a non contra CT. They discard that then it's an hemorrhage, but then they need contrast medical imaging, what's called perfusion to assess how damages the brain and see if there is a clot. What we're trying to do is instead of leveraging on this contrast medical imaging, use non contrast imaging to see if there is a clot. And this is very disruptive because every hospital in the world will be able to see if there is a clot and assess a stroke treatment. So, so this is a bit the, the vision that, that uh, Christian and, and the clinic team had. And when I joined, my role was pretty much of saying, okay, we have this technology and we want to solve this, but how do we bring this to the market? With which partners, with which regulatory strategy, with which team? And, and that's why we combined both very well. So we combined the engineering of Christian, the clinical side of hospital clinic, but also by the Bron and some other hospitals and my business side of, of trying to push this forward. Mm -hmm. Super fascinating as well to see that. No, on one side now, what I wonder now is assuming that you really can provide ample information from that first scan, that first non-contrast uh, image, um, how many uh, hospitals are currently can't do the second step, the contrast image? Because that would kind of give us no sense of the impact that yeah. if this works, what you're working on, the, the, the lives, yeah. the number of lives you could save. Well, um, first, something that I need to state is that our product is under development. It doesn't have still the regulatory process, which we are pursuing now. And it's working uh, real time at a major hospital here in Spain in research purposes. And soon in several other hospitals in, in different places in the world. So we're, we're working on this regulatory process. You can find some, some countries like it could be Brazil, for instance, a huge country that unfortunately you could say over 80% of the hospitals or even more don't have contrast medical imaging. So that the impact is huge. But it also happens here in Spain or in Germany and some other countries that uh, let's say rural hospitals uh, don't have access to, to, to contrast imaging 24 seven. And also there is a shortage of radiologists. So we are not really substituting the radiologists. What we're doing is providing a tool that helps them to assess and to make decisions. And we literally empower every radiologist in the world to have information that ultimately would lead to a better decision. That's, that's our goal. We, we are a tool for the radiologists. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And you're in this area of machine learning and so analyzing data, I imagine. So one core struggle for people out there that maybe have a data background and is this question, well, I think that's fascinating you know, to, to uh, solve that challenge, really help uh, mankind here. Um, how could you get the data, actually? Yeah, so actually you, you can uh, do collaboration agreements with hospitals always is anonymized data that you can use for research. So you, you can reach these kind of agreements. What, what I really want to highlight um, is that I think that building an AI software, particularly in healthcare, the challenge is not only about doing the AI, uh, which is challenging, is it, uh, understanding the workflow of the hospital and how you are actually building a software that is being used. And it's not, so typically think, people would think, okay, let's get a, a, the images, let's uh, do the annotations so that tag them so we can train the algorithm and let's prove the accuracy. But that's, not, that's only a, a small part of the product itself. You really need this product to be integrated with the workflow and being used. For example, with our engineering team, we not only have outstanding engineers in doing AI, but I believe it's important that they also see the clinical part of it, the scientific part of it, the regulatory part of it, because you need to take an holistic approach 
to develop new technologies. Mm -hmm. So collaboration is key in, in this space. I imagine as well, so that means a lot as well, going to the doctors, observing the doctors, observing these flows then of the work steps and so that they do, yeah? Are you spending then days uh, here I mean, uh, with the, in the hospital look, and the whole team as well? Actually, uh, look, uh, I, I'm learning how to read images, uh, tech images, because we're looking at them all the time. But um, look, the thing I love most about my, my work is speaking with doctors across the globe, uh, late in the evening with the guys in the US, uh, what should we do? And, and then they're so passionate about finding solutions, bringing this together. Um, the beauty about the healthcare space is that you can work very closely with them and, and try to push this forward. Uh, and uh, for me, it's a, it's a great opportunity that has a huge challenge, but this is a, is a great, great thing to do. I mean, I, I really encourage everybody to, to explore the healthcare space because it's challenging, but, but you enjoy a lot of the process, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Like I imagine there's uh, two whole beds. If we start with the one, oftentimes people are thinking, oh my God, the medical space, healthcare in general is a regulated, uh, a regulated space. So you now you discuss that it's important as well to understand regulation, which normally then sounds like, oh my God, till we actually get to apply it, it will take years or so. Uh, can you uh, explain to us a bit, like what are the main steps in that space and what to watch out for a bit? Yeah, so the, the challenge here is that obviously in Europe, the, the regulation is changing. Now it's, it's called the MDR. And, and in the US, there, uh, well, this is evolving a lot, right? So there are different pathways. And particularly, it's complicated for a, an early stage startup that, um, that you, you're, you're learning, right? Which is the process, you have the resources that you have. And certainly, it's challenging. Uh, I think that the two key things is, understanding very well what is your product and what are you solving you, you really need to understand what is the use case of your product you need to find uh, consultants and experts that are aligned with your vision because um, i believe that you need first to build the product that makes sense and then see how this fits in the regulatory but not being conditioned from the regulatory only because you end up building a product that doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm convinced that if we work on, on the product that makes sense and we are well advised from the regulatory standpoint, is a matter of being consistent and try to keep pushing through. And it, you'd be surprised once, once you start entering the space and, and you prove a certain track record, people really want to help you. And uh, there is extraordinary people that are either consultants or people from hospitals from everywhere that are really too, too, too willing to help. And that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. And I imagine as well, yes. now you get in touch with them globally almost, no, because the, the, the world is so connected there in that space. How did you find them? How did you uh, reach out then to these experts as well? If we say, which I think is a wonderful message in entrepreneurship as well. No, because many people feel I have to know everything and I need to know a specialist in all these different areas. But here it's really about no focus, maybe no as the CEO on structuring the process and building the team and these challenges and certain things like regulatory. Yes, you can learn and you will learn a lot about it, but as well, definitely work with specialists. How did you find these specialists? Yeah, well, um, I think that uh, or the way I see it is that for me building this company, is, is pretty much about, is what I enjoy to do. It's like, it's, it's my hobby apart from my work. And, I, and the people I work with, I wouldn't say they're my friends, but they're pretty close to be my friends because, uh, and, and you're one of them because actually you, you joined the, recently to our team, but uh, it's, it's great the fact that you help us to engage with other people. And, and I think that the most valuable asset is to bring together people that are passionate that, I, that have experts that are willing to help you in the good and in the bad moments. And, and when you bring together all this talent, things come naturally. So, so you, you meet another investor, you meet another expert. And I think that the key, the, the, the three key things is understanding the vision, executing very well, 
and find the right team that help you to navigate. It's not about meeting everybody. It's about meeting people. And what means a great person? I mean, there's not, there's not a, a definition. It's who you like working with and, and who has a track record. And, and you build your team and then you navigate this space. Mm -hmm. And then so luck. <laughs> Wonderful. I imagine one core challenge for many out there that are maybe not in the biotech space is more this question of legal, right? Everybody has to do legal and find the right lawyers and so. And they're definitely, I know, in this startup space, you work with dedicated lawyers, every city, let's say Berlin, Barcelona, London, and so on. They have their lawyers and everybody more or less goes to the same group of, of people that to get their legal work done. And then it's actually not too bad. You don't have to be the ultra expert. You discuss them step by step and you can figure it out. I imagine with regulatory, my naive thinking about it would be as well that, no, you really say, okay, there are top experts in the field out there. And then I basically, I network. I find out from other people that went through the same challenges. Uh, to find out who's really, really good. So classical, you ask for references, you ask for introductions, and then you meet people, and then you see is their personal fit, is their uh, competence, let's say, fit. Is that, that, that absolutely? You're you're right, and and you you it's a bit of gut feeling, and and I think that, uh, for example, many people have has helped me, and I'm happy to help other people too. What what is important is that you do a, a good use of the time of others and and then for example you're looking for a lawyer you can speak with two or three lawyers and then you have a, a gut feeling and and you and you start collaborating with this person and and yeah i guess is is listening a lot and and trusting i i think that most of uh, things in business and and in life in general is about uh, trusting uh, others and being consistent with what you're saying and and that's how you build it uh, but i don't know i mean this is how we try to do it and <laughs> probably there are other ways but this is the way we do it and it's a journey and i think as well it's so fascinating that know to be part of that journey and observe that journey and then see you know uh, how it will go and that's part as well i think of the excitement it's not so deterministic in the end you have good chances and you work on that you do the best you can like in a race right and uh, times you win and then times you cannot right you, you, you said it earlier and, and sport is, is crucial, right? Uh, what I always say to the team and, and everybody agrees is that we do our best every day. In every single thing that we do, we try to do it the best we can. And, and, and if you combine that with a good team and a vision, ultimately this will become true. Uh, but but uh, who does their best uh, is, is the only thing you really need to look for. And uh, we're committed to our team first, uh, to our investors, to the people we collaborate. And that's the game. I mean, uh, just do the best you can and, 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 and keep on going uh, mm -hmm. because it changes every day. I mean, it's, it's super challenging. Otherwise you don't make it. I mean, uh -huh. Fascinating. One core thing as well. And that one, I guess is a special question for people that want to start something in health care or in general as well where they don't get the immediate payment from the customer is the monetization question right so you okay. can say hey we developed this technology where we can save really virtually thousands if not hundred thousand of people's lives and prevent lots of damages to the brain which you no know, leads to them uh, disabilities and, and 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 reduction of the quality of life and suffering and all of that really uh, sad and, and shocking outcomes um, but but the, the the core question as well is in order to bring it then out to the market, you do need somebody that is paying for this because you no, know, it, it does have a price. And so, how would you think about uh, assuring that uh, you find in a way uh, somebody to pay for the solution if the solution works really well? Yeah. Well, um, it's certain that with artificial intelligence, the reimbursement, particularly in Europe, is is more complicated and is is getting the adoption is is getting more and more uh, uh, in this in, in the different countries. For me, what what is fundamental is to uh, bring value. I mean, what what the focus should be in value and not in price only. So it's a matter of saying, um, in our case, how are we going to bring value to the workflow to the patients? What is the impact? So you have to understand what you want to tackle. Then 
you need to, you need to demonstrate somehow in our cases with a retrospective study to validate the algorithms, but then with a prospective clinical study, and if you want a health economics, or you really need to prove uh, which is the value that it brings. And, and then obviously you have different alternatives, right? So you can partner with medical imaging companies, with medical devices companies, you can do reimbursement processes, you can do collaboration agreements, but, but this is something that is important. But the key thing is to prove the value. And once you prove the value, then you can explore which is the best way. Because again, the go to market depends on many things. So you can, you can go to one market or to the other. You can do many different kinds of partnerships. And to be honest, you, you don't really know. I mean, you, you, you have some ideas, you're in touch with some people, you're in the game. But at the end of the day, is focusing on this value and, and what makes more sense. And every decision in each, in each step, right? You, if you anticipate too much things, um, I don't think, for example, pricing or, 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 or the market size. I mean, you need to have a rough idea of the impact of what you're doing. But nobody would really look at the pricing exactly and what you're going to do. It, it, I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, you can build it. You can put it in a slide. That's fine. But if you find the sense of what you're doing and you validate, I think you're good to go. Mm -hmm. No, and I can definitely see that. No, kind of this, this big pain behind it because so many people is just occurring so frequently and has these devastating effects. And so how would you say, which to me, no, let's say the classical and the software a few would say, okay, it's great with a B2B customer to try to quantify the value proposition, right? Really put a dollar term, a euro term there. The overall solution is, is much better than just having checkpoints and then kind of promises there. Um, as you think about value, how would you think about in the healthcare space about value, no? And ensuring that you really deliver value. So there are uh, two different drivers, right? So one is related to the health economics. So you're saying you have, let's say, a population and your technology changes somehow the, the standard of care, okay? So, so in our case, uh, we're able to potentially, let's say, when we have the product in the market to reduce time to treatment. So what's the impact in time to treatment? So you say you reduce the number of disabilities and you reduce the number of deaths. Okay, which is the cost for the healthcare systems of these disabilities? Uh, so there is a cost that is very little of not doing contrast imaging, which is operational. But then there is a cost of reducing the disabilities that is not only a reduction of the direct cost for the healthcare system, but also indirect for families. Have in mind somebody that is 50 years old, suffers a stroke and could live, let's say, 30 more years. I mean, this is a huge for cost for the healthcare systems, but for the families, he, uh, he or she cannot work again. The families have to do so. So what we're solving is a huge impact. On the other hand, from a, from a private setting, is about uh, doing more treatments. So if you're able to, let's say that you perform endovascular treatments and you, you get paid for the insurer about for doing these treatments, the fact that you're able to, to reduce the time to treatment and, and, and therefore treat more patients increases the chances that you can perform more treatments and generate more revenues. So, so you, you have to see it from the, the two angles. Then obviously, as I said, you, you can reduce operational cost, but that is very little compared to the overall impact. Understood. So, I think, yeah, I, I see where you're going in terms of like, get, get, you know, really thinking through different things. One would be purely operational costs as such, very trivial, but here we really say, you know, well, as people are, are saved in terms of lives, disabilities, hospitalization, all these, that, this is a massive um, improvement you know, that could be generated if, if you could substantially uh, reduce time to treatment, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. Also improves uh, the coordination among the different healthcare professionals, and this is really meant to 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 improve these operational uh, different different activities. So mm -hmm. yeah, hundred yeah, percent.
Wonderful. So I can see you now, no, uh, focusing on these things and building out the technology. You have your co-founder there building the team up. And so, what would you say in terms of going forward, the decisive things, the make or breaks, or so for the company, as in terms of like the next steps and so, what you are focusing on? Yeah. So, so we we close a fundraising uh, six months ago that was close to a couple of million. And this helped us to, to go through the FDA approval and the CMR, uh, hopefully in, in the next uh, next months. And um, then we were working also in some clinical studies uh, to validate prospectively the, the impact of our technology. We're also exploring some collaborations and, and, and we're looking at some distribution agreements also. So you were saying commercialize, see how we can do the go-to-market. We're now at a point in which we really need to decide what is our bet and which is the specific uh, tactic that we're going to, to use. And, and, and yeah, once we, we have this feedback uh, from the regulatory standpoint, we, we, we increase and we get the installation base a bit wider. We refine a bit more the, the go-to-market. Uh, we're looking to to do a, another uh, well, a series A, a larger series A. I, I really want to quantify exactly what we want to do. So we know that we will need some financing, is, but we want to be, uh, it's not about fundraising for fundraising. It's fundraising for what and then to achieve what and how it's reasonable. And again, with, with which partners, at which speed, and hopefully by the end of, of the third term, we, we hopefully close the fundraising. We will see how it evolves. And this will help us to, to, to focus on the go-to-market, right? So to start implementing. And to me, what is crucial, look, is, is, is not a matter of maximizing revenues at short. It's about finding the quickest way in the go-to-market so that we can save uh, as many lives as possible, that we can prove that our technology has an impact. And I'm convinced that if we're able to do this, it will be much easier later on to scale. So it's not a business to, to generate super quick revenues now. We need to validate in the market the impact of our technology. And then we can further develop other products in the pipeline or potentially other diseases. But it's very much focused on execution. You, you validate your technology, then you bring it to the market, then you prove that you have some traction. I mean, it seems to be very basic, <laughs> it's complicated, but, but, but these are the key things. I mean, uh, I, I see it's, it's not only about raising for raising, it's mm -hmm. not about doing for doing. It's, okay, where I wanna go with a consensus with everybody. So with the clinical part, with the board members, and align everybody towards this goal. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, maybe for people that are thinking, oh my God, like I find it so inspiring to do something in the health space. I've learned now a bit what to focus on and that even regulatory and so issues, which I might not be the expert in, I can solve by finding the experts. It's all about really build, building the teams here as well. Uh, for you personally, what's the best, how do you learn personally uh, in this space and uh, what, how to do, how to navigate? Do you have certain blogs that you listen to or, or read, sorry, no. on certain podcasts? I mean, I think that um, like to find the right mentors, you need to be a good mentee, right? So people, uh, some people tend to think, okay, I have this person in the advisory board or these other. I mean, that's useless if if they don't contribute or you or you are not able to get the most out of them because it's not their their role to 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 teach you. I mean, you need to help them to help you. So so the first exercise is I think is try to see okay who and 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 what is success, right? I mean, it, culture is very important and it's, it's not a matter of, oh, this person is the CEO of, uh, I don't know, G. Then I want, maybe they have a vision of the world that is not the same that you have. So you need to find somebody that has the track record, but that also is, is passionate about what you're doing. And, and, and you need to deserve also your, their time. I mean, you, you, need, you need to listen. 
And, and when you get the right mentors, you need to apply what they tell you. Because if you have the mentors to just put them in a PowerPoint, that, that doesn't make any sense. And, and when you're able to listen to your mentors and make progress, then they trust you and they, they open you to more mentors. And when you do the same thing, you build a, a solid blog. So sometimes less is more. Just pick the people and, and, and just find a balance of, of engaging with people. It's, it's, it needs, it's like cooking. It needs, it needs time. It's not, it's not about rushing things. I mean, you, you need to, to start building relationships and start showing that you're performing. But again, I mean, everybody does it their way. And I, I, I don't know, this is how, I, how we approach it and how we enjoy it. Uh -huh. I, I just I just thought that when you were saying this developing as the mentee as well, I think it's a wonderful perspective because indeed many people then they they network and they get these at least on paper great supporters, but they don't find really a way to you know, to learn from them to develop together and uh, know to to do it in a way that it really uh, uh, generates value. So I thought as well in a way using the background of sports again, in a way it's it's not just all about having an, 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 a really strong coach. If you're not a player that actually knows, you know, how to take the lead from the coach and just think, hey, I'm the best or whatever. I have my game plan anyhow, right? So I was thinking in a way you have to have that mindset as well that you want to be a top athlete, top performance in your space. So know as well then how to use in a way a top coach that you have. Because I think that's not what many people reflect on actually. So super and, fascinating. And, and building on that, and let's put in, in soccer. I mean, let's say a club has a philosophy of doing things. So not every coach works for every club and not every player works for that club with that coach in that position. So you, you, you really need to, to be very coherent in what you're building. And I think that if you have the alignment of the culture of the club with the culture of the, of, of the coach and the team, it becomes so obvious. That, that, that it's the perfect, but building this is, is seasonal and, and is, is a matter of, of, of working it with patience and, and, and uh, you know, is, is, is working it out, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, pa uh, Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. Paul, the CEO, co-founder of Meetings here, saving lives in this world, super inspiring. Thanks so much for sharing all these insights. It's always a pleasure, Jan, I must say that I enjoy a lot of speaking with you and, and you, you really, really bring a lot of value to all of us. So, so thank you so much for, for your time and, and for your mentoring too. <laughs> thank you. It goes both ways as always. <laughs> all the best. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.